n minus 1 over k. Oh, and of course, uh, and the odd ones are 0. Okay, so what, what I'm trying to tell you at the moment is we are right on target. We have precisely, it's like this example, yeah? In this example, I also told you we happen to know already that the Betty numbers are 1, 0, 3. In degree 0, it's 1. Degree 1, it's 0. Degree 2, it's 3. We happen to know that already. And when I, when I, uh, when I circled the yellows, I told you in some sense we know that this is the right answer because the degree of this is 2, the degree of this is 2, the degree of this is 2. So we have three module basis elements with the uh, right degree. And I'm telling you the same thing here. Okay? So, um, these facts put together. So this one yes. I'm sorry. Everything I'm saying is for the Peterson variety oh, only. Totally this is yeah. Everything I'm saying. Everything us. Uh, yes. Uh, at the moment is for the Peterson case. Yeah. But I. Yes. Ah, I'm sorry. So, so this is the Peterson case. This is the Milpitz Springer oh, right. case. I'm sorry. So they are they are different. Yes, um, but but for for some of what I'm saying, they are similar. Yeah, because here also I'm telling you the way we picked these. It so happens that for the Peterson case, we are right on target for the Betty numbers. And also for this Milpitz Springer case, here it's so small I can literally draw them and we can draw them so that we are right on target for the Betty numbers. Um, okay, so let me just say, so, so what I'm about to say is some technical linear algebra argument with Borella covariant cohomology. I don't go through it, okay? But it's not hard, but it's just a technical thing. Okay, uh, but anyway, the facts, facts one through three imply, so if you know these facts, then you actually know automatically from a general argument that, in fact, the PVA form a model basis. So I just remind you that it's the Peterson by writing it out. <laughs> okay? So this is everything I'm saying is for the Peterson case. So this achieves the answer to the million dollar question for this case. For this case. Yes? So this, uh, first, is it, it has to be true that those BAs are all different if you start from a different? Uh, sure, and they are. They're definitely all different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's okay. So, so if I have, if I can, let's see. So it's a general fact that if two, if, if two permutations have reduced word decompositions where a certain simple transposition appears in one but not in the other, then they're different. Let me say that again. Yes, I will say it again. I have two permutations, let's call them W1 and W2. Is that a good, okay, never mind, okay. W1 and W2, fine. Okay, all right. Let's suppose that the simple transposition S5 appears in W1 but not in W2. Then the, these two transposition, the, these two, God, these two permutations are different. Okay, but now if I take two distinct subsets, then obviously there's at least one index that appears in one and not in the other, so they're different. So they're all different. Yeah. Yes. They are Ah, yes. Okay, excellent. So this tells me that they're linearly independent. The upper triangularity, which makes sense from linear algebra. Yeah? Just so, so please remember, yeah? So if you're in first year college linear algebra, and I have a set of vectors, which, are, which when you write them out, they're upper triangular, then they're linearly independent. Right? PVA. 
Okay, you know, um, can I draw one picture and maybe it will help? Okay. Here's a schematic picture. What time is it? Anyway. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yes. here, you, you are having bed, bed numbers. Yes. Bed numbers is for ordinary uh, Yes, I'm sorry, I should have said that, yes. And then, but this thing is for ordinary Yes, but it's okay because, please remember, in my, in my assumptions, I'm assuming that everything I'm dealing with is a free module. So, 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 as an, so, H, as an HS, as an HS1 module, it is nothing else than, well, it is isomorphic to HS1 tensor, the ordinary cohomology. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that is part oh, of the assumption. Okay. That's that, so somehow within everything we are doing, this is always true for all of my uh, cohomology rings. That's as right. a module, it's just free over the base ring. That's because of odd degree. Everything, that's right, that's right. Therefore, uh, therefore, arguments like this on the ordinary cohomology actually tell me something about the equivariant. Yes, yes. Okay, now let me see if I can make Tomo happy. Okay, so, uh, so this, um, all right. Two schematic pictures. Okay, so let's suppose, yeah? That okay, so I'm starting at E and I have W, W prime, etc. So this is just in S4. I have my Bruja graph, yeah, etc. etc. Okay, now the Schubert classes have the property that if I'm at some point W prime, then I am non-zero at W prime and only at things above me. And that's true of any Schubert class. Okay? Now, Tomo, do you agree that that implies that these Schubert classes are linearly independent? No, it's just, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just a prop, I, I'm just, okay. So if I have, so if I have a linear combination of the Schubert classes, which is zero, I want to prove that all the constants are zero. Right? Because you are talking about the function supported on those, yeah, those. Uh, That's those. right. Okay. Tomo is not happy. Let me try again. Okay, Schubert, I'm thinking about Schubert classes in terms of their values at the fixed points. Is that okay? That's the whole GKM framework, yeah? That I will just talk about them as what their values are, what the polynomials are at the fixed points. Okay? Now, what I just said is that for, for every Schubert class, the following statement is true. If I want the Schubert class corresponding to W, then the polynomial for that Schubert class at W is non-zero, and it is only non-zero above W. That's true for any one of these Schubert classes. Do you agree that that implies linear independence? Good, okay. And now the schematic picture for what this is trying to say is as follows. Okay, so what this means, I, some of you looked puzzled when I wrote this out, so I, let me try to explain it better. Okay, so, so what this means is, okay, so I have a similar picture, and let me try to follow my own picture here. It's a very schematic picture, but never mind. Okay, so if I have uh, whatever I have, okay, okay, so, so whatever. I have some Bruja graph, it has edges, etc. Okay, now, I am at some WA. Okay? Now, I am picking a VA which is less than me. So I have to have some edges going down that points to VA. So this is the way I have drawn it. Okay? So this is the picture. So I had my, yeah, my pink and then I'm circling with my yellow. So that's fact number one. So certainly it should be that this VA, sorry, the PVA is certainly non-zero here. At the very least I should have that. Okay. Now, the problem is the problem is, when I want to prove linear independence, for the Schubert classes, I had perfect, you know, I had perfect properties. It's zero, you know, everywhere except above, above and so on. But now, that I, but now if I want to think about uh, calculating PVA on the fixed points, so maybe they are, you know, uh, well, wherever they are, so maybe they're something like this, 
okay? If I'm calculating PV at the fixed points, unfortunately, it could happen, it is possible that it could happen that this PVA is non-zero at those fixed points which are not in, which are not above me, but somehow stranded elsewhere. Does it make sense? So, because PVA is non-zero everywhere above PVA, not above WA, it's, it's, it's non-zero everywhere above PVA, which is lower. So now my, the things which are greater than it might be a larger set than the fixed points that are bigger than WA. So for example, I might be non-zero here, I might be non-zero here. And that would be bad, at least in terms of trying to show linear independence. Does it make sense? Kind of. Okay, what I'm trying, okay, so what I'm trying, okay, maybe, maybe not. Uh, well, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that this situation does not happen. What happens is, um, what this is saying is, if I have a PVA and I'm trying to compute at my fixed points, then the only time that I have fixed points, which are um, bigger than PVA, are when, in fact, they are also already uh, bigger than WA. So I don't have any stray fixed points outside of the upper order ideal of WA. Therefore, I still have this nice linear independence. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, this, this uh, upper triangularity from which the independence follows very easily. Yeah, but then there's a difference between C1 EA and PVA, right? That's the whole point. Oh, wait, PV, uh, well, yes, yes. So Yes. Some red thing was not zero, but then if you send it to uh, SM word variety fixed points, I mean you have this projection, right? Ah uh, yes, yes, yes. And something which was non zero, that became zero. I don't care about that. You don't care about that. Not for linear independence, I don't. As long as I know that at WA it projects to non-zero, then I'm okay. Anything else, if I, if anything else, I, if it wants to project to zero, I don't care. But how do you know? Uh, and at WA, I can compute it explicitly. Oh, and then you know that. And I know. Oh, okay. 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 Some, like, make sure that yeah, absolutely. Ab oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this implies independence, and this implies that it spans, basically. I mean, there's a technical argument, but this is independence, and this says it spans. Uh, so to say it's a basis, I should prove independence and I should prove that I get everything, that it spans. And I'm just saying, uh, so it is a technical argument, but essentially this tells me independence and this tells me that it spans. Okay, okay. All right, so let's see. All right, let's do the following. Okay, uh, so I have 15 minutes, so let me say um, the following. So this is not really a theorem. I'm just going to write that there exists a theorem. Okay, so um, if you look, we can actually, what, I'm tr what I want to just tell you now is, um, that if you look in, in the last section of, of our paper on, from, on Peterson varieties, you will see that using this very explicit formula for the PVAs, we can actually derive manifestly positive, manifestly integral structure constants for the cohomology ring of S1 equivalent cohomology ring of the Peterson varieties. In other words, we can do Schubert calculus exactly how everybody wants you to do it for the Peterson case using these. Um, I thought there are so many different Peterson varieties, but the, the Peterson variety you wrote as a Essenberg variety. Yes. Uh, principal. Yes. Uh, yes. No potent. Yes. So that is the unique Peterson. Well, so there's so so within type A, there's a family of them by varying n, and then as I uh, you can do them for all the types. So there is a unique Peterson variety in each uh, sub variety. 
pretty much, as far as I understand. Yeah. Okay, so let me simply say there exists an uh, explicit, manifestly positive, manifestly integral formulas for structure constants. Okay, so I will not write it out now, but please look. It's, it's very simple, really. Because really, you're just playing with power sets. I mean, playing with subsets. So it, it, it turns out to be quite simple. It's been a really long time. So to say? What I mean by manifestly positive is I write for you the formula, and you see from the formula, the formula says count this set. Or it says it is this binomial coefficient. I, the formula itself tells you that the, the result uh, is positive. In other words, it has no cancellations. Right? So, so somebody could hand you a formula which, when you look at the formula, it's you know, an alternating sum of some things, and then you actually compute the darn thing, and it turns out to be positive. But the formula doesn't tell you that it's positive. So that's what I mean when I say it's manifestly positive. And similarly, it's manifestly integral in the same sense. Every single summand in the formula is an actual integer. So of course, the result is in an integer. So again, same thing, yeah? So, so you know, the localization formula, or a Tia Bot Berlin Vern, gives you formulas of rational functions, and then there's magical cancellations, and you get a polynomial. That's not what's happening. I'm giving you a formula where everything is an integer, and everything is positive. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 I'm talking about the Petersons. Yeah, yeah but that, that this kind of thing exists for full flat by. Uh, it exists for Grassmann. Um, so that is a point uh, that, that I think. How much do you know about <sighs> So, some, okay, is that Kaskun um, in Chicago? Uh, has some fundamental results, which um, I'm not sure I understand, but he seems to have made a huge amount of progress. But um, I don't exactly know how to interpret what he's saying. So the state of the art at the moment is maybe some really smart person, namely that knows the answer, but the rest of us haven't digested it yet. So like I was, I was thinking, because you have, if you have this manifestly positive formula for flat variety, yes. you can pull back those formulas to experience of variety, but that's not what you're doing. That's not what we're doing. Yeah. Um, for the flag variety, it's, 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 it's hard. It's well known to be hard. And, and as I say, there seems there's some recent work that I don't understand, which makes some progress. It's what I was just saying. So, so manifestly but positive. I do have to explain it, but is it usually accepted in mathematics? I don't know if it's usually accepted in mathematics. I know that it is often used in the Schubert calculus literature to mean what I just said. So that's a pseudo It's a pseudo pseudo mathematical term. At least in the Schubert calculus, it is understood that that's what is meant. Okay, so now, um, okay, so here's what I think I need to do. Um, let me try to explain posts at pinball by pictures only. Okay, so, so, so what I was trying to say here is to motivate the rules for the combinatorial game that I'm about to propose in 10 minutes. Uh, so what we should always try to do is I give you a Bruja graph. SN. That's where we start. I circle for you some subset in pink, for example. Okay? And now what do we want to do? We want somehow to associate, uh, um, well, the yellow permutations to the pink permutations, as we said earlier, where we would want to have this 
we want to have this and we want to have that. Okay. All right. In an ideal world that we would do that, we can't always, but here's, so here's the idea. So post it pinball does the following. Okay. So one can formulate it more generally, but because of lack of time, let me try to just say uh, for SN. So start with a subset. Are we back in the string variety or any symbol variety? Uh, so let's say, so pinball itself is a purely combinatorial game and it could be played for anything, but just for the sake of discussion, let's say we have in our minds the Milpitz and Hessenberg varieties, but it doesn't have to be. The, the game itself is pure combinatorics. So, okay, so what we start with is a subset J of curly J of SN, okay? And what we want to do is to do the following. So the picture, so I don't know, uh, this is a possibly a very American thing. Does, do people know what I mean when I say pinball? Have you, yes. so, so, you, so you have spent some time in the US and so have you, but maybe other people who have not spent time in the US, do you know what I mean by pinball? Okay, so, 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 so here's how it looks. Yeah, so you go into a video arcade, you're a child, okay, and your parents take you to a, a, a game store. And, and it's, 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 a large, it's a large game, it's about the size of this desk, except it's tilted up, and then little steel balls start shooting out, and then there are all kinds of, uh, of, of slides and uh, pulleys and walls, and you have to try, it's kind of like pachinko, but it's slower. <laughs> um, and so these balls start shooting out and then they fall according, according to gravity and then they end up at certain places and then bells ring and lights go off. And, okay, so, so the idea, so the analogy is you should think about SN as a tilted board. So the minimum is, so the, the, at the bottom you have the identity, at the top you have the, the maximal full inversion. And so you think of this as being on this pinball board. Okay, and so each of these, so now on SN, you should think of each of these as slots where a pinball can rest temporarily. So these steel balls on the pinball board, they start, so at the start of the game, you have steel balls at each of these slots, at the pink slots. Okay, now what we're going to do, okay, so I really don't have time, so I think I'll just talk now. Okay, so what you're going to do is, first, just arbitrarily, let's pick a total order on the pink steel balls that is subordinate to the partial order. Okay, so of course if I know that this is less than that, then I shouldn't invert them, but, but, it's support, but otherwise it's just an arbitrary order. Okay, now I'm going to start at the top. Take the top steel ball, okay, and now each of the edges of the Bruja graph, you should imagine on this pinball uh, game, there's a, little, there's a little slide where the steel ball can roll down, okay? Everybody visualize this with me. Okay, very good. So now, um, so now, uh, at the, uh, so the, at the start of the game, I, I just let the ball go. So right, so there's a button there and I can press it and I, and I just let the ball go and it starts rolling down according to gravity, which is to say according to the Bruja edges. Okay, now I'm going to just let it roll as far, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I want to start at the bottom. Sorry, I should start at the bottom and let it go. Okay, and then it just rolls wherever it should, uh, wherever it rolls. And now there's a rule, which is to say that the, the board is set up so that the slots are small and only one ball can occupy a slot at any given time. So, if I have a ball already resting here, then this ball can't roll there. Okay, so in other words, another way to say it is the pinball game is designed so that as soon as a slot, as soon as a ball passes an edge, then a little wall comes up and now uh, this ball can't roll down this slide anymore. Okay, so that's, so the basic game is I take these balls and I just start dropping them. So drop this one, drop this one, drop this one, and drop this one. And now let's see what can happen. For this particular example, 
this can be an outcome of just that game. I take this guy and I drop it. Well, it's already at the minimum. It's at the bottom of the board, so it doesn't move. This one, and so I'm already here, so this wall has come up. So there's a wall here. Okay, so I can't roll. Now I release this one. Now it can't go anywhere, so it stays put. Now I release this one. It can roll. It rolls to there, but it can't roll here because I have a wall there. And now this guy I release, and it rolls. So it could roll. So this is non-deterministic, just like Pachinko, right? Okay. So this rolls, and it could roll. Let's see. So let's see. Uh, well, okay. So one way it could roll, obviously, is here and land there. Okay. But now I have a slight problem. If I if I just play this in this non-deterministic way, it could be that instead of rolling to here, I roll to, this last one rolls to here, right? If you just play the game as I just described, it could roll there. But then, of course, now, now we stop playing the game and we start looking at the geometry and we know that this is bad because this would correspond to bad betting numbers. It's 1, 0, 2, 0, 1. Okay, so now I can introduce a few more rules. Okay, a few, uh, the, so I can introduce rules to the betting, uh, to, to my game by saying, okay, let's play a slightly more refined game of, of rolling the steel balls. Every time, so there's two different things I can do. One is, every time I roll down uh, to, to some slot, then, please remember, I want to be upper triangular. So that means what I should do is as soon as I, let's see, so what am I trying to say? Uh, as soon as I roll to, um, sorry, wait, uh, sorry, what do I want to do? Um, sorry, I want to, sorry, what do I want to do? I want to place walls for all, ah, yes, okay. So, um, so once, okay, so once I release, uh, once I release uh, from a particular slot, I should erase all the edges that point down from that slot. Okay, that would, that would enforce upper triangularity. Another rule I could impose is once, if I, if I know already in, in advance what the betting number should be, then once I have filled all possible, um, once, I, once I have filled all slots with a particular betting number, then I should place, all, place walls so that I don't go further on those betting numbers. So what I'm just trying to say is um, if, you, if you refine the rules to that so that you place more walls, then as you're sending these steel balls rolling down, then you are always guaranteeing yourself uh, that you have upper triangularity or that you preserve the betting numbers. So this is the game that we propose to play. Um, and a fact, which I don't have time to write, a fact is you can get, so, so, this, so these VAs that I wrote down the formula earlier, they are nothing other than just a result of playing this game. Okay? And also, and the example that I told you earlier is also the same. It's, well, we just did it together. It's also a result of playing this game. So, the formulation of the, of the game just tells you that, okay, all that you're trying to do is to, is to roll balls down, <laughs> down pinball slides and to do it in a, in a nice way. Okay? Um, and, well, okay, so again, I, do, I don't have time. But, um, so I have given you two examples, the Peterson example and this example. And we actually have a few more examples where it just, we can actually play this game successfully and actually get module bases. Um, so it seems to be a, at least a useful way to formulate the question um, and to formulate at least a way to study, um, study the answer to the million dollar question. So, all right, let me stop here. <laughs>